Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Chamati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastyatyade Shatarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhamityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Vanchakalpa Charubhyas Chai Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Paditanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha So yes, devotees, we finished off in verse 30 of chapter 4 last night. Uh, and I'm just going to read it again, actually, just so we get a little bit of our focus back. The subject has been, uh, the subject has been sacrifice. And, and we, just the last so many verses, we read about all different types of sacrifices for all different types of people. But of course, ultimately, they have to be connected with Krishna. Otherwise, it's, it's more or less useless, actually. Well, it's not just more or less useless, it is simply useless. Yeah, so now, uh, Lord Krishna is going, is summing up, basically. He's concluding uh, the, the study of sacrifice and drawing out some conclusions there. So let's read verse 30 again, the translation. All these performers, now all these performance mean, performers means all the different types of people who are doing the different sacrifices. All these performers who know the meaning of sacrifice become cleansed of sinful reactions and Having tasted the nectar of the results of sacrifices, they advance towards the supreme eternal atmosphere. Yeah, particularly if they, while doing the sacrifice, there's some Krishna consciousness. Right, so uh, they, uh, they're trying to in the purport, Srila Prabhupada explains, these people are trying to uh, control their senses and, and get focused in life and not get distracted by their senses. And by acting in that way, if we act in that way, focusing on Krishna while controlling our senses and keeping ourselves uh, positively engaged in Krishna conscious activity, then uh, they'll help us come, as the verse says, as Lord Krishna says, they advance towards the supreme eternal atmosphere. Yes, they advance like that. Uh, and ultimately, it means ultimately uh, they'll come to the level of uh, going to Goloka Vrindavan. You know, some of them, of course, at least, if, if they were to just carry on without Krishna consciousness, maybe some of them would realize Brahman, maybe, but maybe not, because it is not common. It is really not common. There are people who want to realize Brahman actually realize Brahman. So ultimately, really, what is being said is that they should do these things in Krishna consciousness, and if they do that nicely, then they'll, uh, they'll go to Goloka Vrindavan to associate with Krishna. So now, yes, so continuing the conclusion, the summary, Krishna then speaks verse 31, O oh, best of the Kuru dynasty, without sacrifice, one can never live happily on this planet or in this life. What then of the next? 
Uh, well, okay. Now, you may remember back in chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. Lord Krishna explained how this creation was brought into being by the, the Lord, the Lord of all beings. And he placed in it uh, humans, demigods, animals, etc. Uh, and sacrifice. In other words, the process of sacrifice is just a fundamental, foundational feature of life in this world. And if people do sacrifice, which is what the world is intended for, then they'll live happily. Krishna says back there in the third chapter, they'll live happily in this life. And then at the end of this life, uh, they'll go back to Godhead. So this verse here, number chapter four, verse 31, is basically reiterating that point in, yeah. In fact, he is really reiterating it. Without sacrifice, one can never live happily on this planet or in this life. What then of the next? Forget it. Completely forget it. So in the purport, uh, Srila Prabhupada expresses that nicely right right at the beginning of the purport the first the first words whatever form of material existence one is in one is invariably ignorant of his real situation in other words existence in the material world is due to the multiple reactions to our sinful lives ignorance is the cause of sinful life and sinful life is the cause of one's dragging on in material existence. So basically, Srila Prabhupada is in the purport is getting into this point that without sacrifice, you can't live happily on this planet in this life or what to speak of the next. So he continues on like that. Uh, the human form of life uh, is the human form of life, Prabhupada actually uses the term, it's a loophole. If you understand loophole, uh, lo generally loophole is sort of a term in law uh, that the, the uh, government makes a law that you can't do this and you can't do that and whatever different things you can't do. But they miss one thing that they should have said, you can't do that, but they miss it and someone does it and they want to punish him. But then he or his lawyer says, wait a minute, there's a loophole. There's a hole you can just sneak through. So the human form of life is a loophole. Uh, to get out of this material world for people who otherwise, otherwise, they would be suffering. They would really be suffering. And that includes us. If uh, I know many, so many, maybe all, I can definitely speak for myself, if, if I hadn't got Krishna consciousness, I just hate to think what my future would have been. And But I got Krishna consciousness by Prabhupada's mercy, Lord Chaitanya's mercy, but I didn't deserve it. I was not a very good candidate. I was just a wild young fellow. Phew. Gee whiz. But somehow or other, managed to sneak through and get into Krishna consciousness. So, therefore, well, it's the same point about yajna. We have to perform yajna. If we don't 
you've got no chance. And even, even if you don't perform Sankirtan Yajna in this age, you've basically hardly got much chance, if any. So this is explained there in, in 31, uh, that we, we should perform Yajna, particularly Sankirtan Yajna, and then go back to Godhead. And then 32 is the last verse in this little subsection. Yeah, this, this point, the summary, you could say. Uh, the summary of all the information about sacrifice of different types. So 32, all these different types of sacrifice are approved by the Vedas. And all of them are born of different types of work. Knowing them as such, you will become liberated. Yeah, so summarizing all the different types of sacrifice. Um, you know, we're not going to go back through them again, the different types, but some of them involved sacrifice on the level of the body like sacrifice of possessions. Some involved sacrifice with the mind, maybe s s focusing on some meditation, and some involved uh, sacrifice with the intelligence, like the brahmacharis. They had to study scripture and learn scripture. It's a type of sacrifice. Uh, but all of them, whatever, whichever one, uh, the idea is, the recommendation is, these are for something higher, not just for improving your material situation in this life here, but for a higher goal, and particularly for Krishna consciousness, getting out of this material world. So then there's verse 33, which, according to our analysis, kind of stands on its own, you could say, that transcendental knowledge, it's talking about at least, transcendental knowledge leading to liberation and ultimately devotional service. And Krishna makes an interesting and important point <clears throat> oh, chastiser, chastiser of the enemy, the sacrifice performed in knowledge is better than the mere sacrifice of material possessions. After all, O oh son of Prita, all sacrifices of work culminate in transcendental knowledge. Okay. Yes. So... Shri Prabhupada there, in the purport, let's just have a quick look. Uh, Shri Prabhupada begins the purport by saying, the purpose of all sacrifices is to arrive at the status of complete knowledge, then to gain release from material miseries, and ultimately to engage in loving transcendental service to the Supreme Lord, to the Supreme Lord, Krishna Consciousness. Uh, so, but it's, Prabhupada makes an interesting point that, in just in the next sentence, nonetheless, <coughs> there is a mystery about all these different types of, different activities of sacrifice. And one should know this mystery. So he goes on to explain, people will do, they'll choose this sacrifice or that sacrifice uh, in terms of their, their natures. But Prabhupada particularly says here, according to their particular faith, and we, we can also bear in mind, that the particular faith of a person will be in terms of their nature. 
Yes. So like this, when one's, so the secret, we're talking about this mystery. When one's faith reaches the stage of transcendental knowledge, then you're more advanced than someone who's simply just rejecting material things, that materialistic type of renunciation. You remember we, we uh, read about two types of renunciation. One is when you see everything as being Krishna's property, then you engage it in his service, and you, without attachment for yourself on your own behalf, but then materialistic, falgu vairagya, fruit of renunciation means that you, uh, you just reject things, you just reject them. There could be different reasons for doing that, but the basic point is <coughs> you, you just reject things without understanding their relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, so Prabhupada goes on that those who simply sacrifice material possessions without that transcendental knowledge, uh, they, their sacrifices remain on the material platform, give no spiritual benefit. So real knowledge culminates in Krishna consciousness, the highest stage of transcendental knowledge. So that's the basic point. That's the basic point here. There has to be sacrifice done in knowledge, transcendental knowledge. And of course, from the earlier parts of this chapter four, we remember what is the essence of that transcendental knowledge? What is the essence? Yes, that uh, one should understand the transcendental nature. Janma karma chame divyam. Janma means birth or appearance. Uh, karma, of course, means activities. Janma karma chame of me. Divyam. Divyam means transcendental or divine beyond material nature. You, you remember we discussed this a couple of days ago, a few days ago. This is the essence of, tran of transcendental knowledge, particularly in this context. To understand Krishna and first of all, to understand him in terms of how he appears, and what are his activities? What is, what is the nature of his activities like this? So this really is that, that is certainly the essence of the transcendental knowledge, which has been referred to throughout the chapter in different ways and different contexts. Yeah. Yes, so, so that means your sacrifice has really been successful. So now we come on to the final section from verse 34 to verse 42, which is the end of the, of the chapter. And again, well, it's titled Summary of Transcendental Knowledge. And it's a summary on a higher level, in fact, not just looking at the, the detailed activities, but the principles involved. Uh, right, so verse 34 uh, is famous verse, just super famous verse. Generally, any practicing devotee will be quite familiar with it. Just try to learn the truth by approaching a spiritual master. Inquire, inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. The self-realized souls can impart knowledge unto you because they have seen the truth. So the truth, what truth? <laughs> the truth, you know, 
the truth. What is this truth? Well, it's what we were just talking about. Krishna, that's the truth. Krishna is the absolute truth. I remember the first day I visited a temple. It was the temple in London. And I went there and spent several hours there. A good, you know, the whole day really. Until it became dark. And in the, in the, at the end of the day, they introduced me to the temple president, who was Dhananjaya Prabhu. Some of you know him, I'm sure. Such a nice devotee. And somehow, we stumbled on the fact that we are actually related. Oh, what an amazing arrangement of Krishna. And we are talking, and I, and I told him, well, you know, I'm just looking for the truth, which was the truth. I'm just looking for the truth. I really was. And he said to me, well, this is the absolute truth. And it went, something went click. Aha, that's right. So that combined with the fact that we were relatives convinced me enough to come and stay. So that's the truth that's being talked about. That's the only truth that's being talked about. There are not other types of truths which are really significant or substantial. I mean, there's definitely no other absolute truths. So it's a famous verse and a famous purport uh, you know, one, one other understanding, which is important, is that uh, all these different types of sacrifices for different, at least on the surface of it, for different types of goals, uh, one could be confused. What should I do? Which type of sacrifice? Well, you want to know? Then, then approach the spiritual master. Then you'll find out what process of sacrifice you should do. Yes, so anyway, I'm just going to very briefly touch on the main points in the purport. It's a real, you know, it's a really valuable pur purport. So Prabhupada brings out the following, I, I've extracted in simple terms the following nine points. First is, the path of spiritual realization is difficult, so we need a spiritual master. Uh, then second point, the Lord is the original spiritual master and the ultimate spiritual master, so the spiritual masters of today, or of any time after the time of the Lord, but let's say today, the spiritual masters of today must present his message faithfully as it is. No manufacturing. So Prabhupada makes this point. So, okay, so now we, we need a spiritual master. We must approach a spiritual master. And how do we do that? In what way do we do that? We must surrender to the spiritual master and be ready to take the position of a menial servant. Fourth point, we have to satisfy the spiritual master. It's a personal relationship. And when you have a personal relationship, then you can't just go by the rules and regulations. You have to uh, satisfy the other person in, in relevant and very personal ways. So then point five, there are two basic activities. The basic mood is one of surrender, but the... Uh, the activities, too, 
one must inquire and one must serve submissively. Pari prashnena means by inquiries. Sevaya, the verse says like that, to inquire and serve. Otherwise it won't work. It's not just an academic process, sentimental. You actually have to inquire and serve. And then interesting point number six, one must pass the test of the spiritual master. And when he sees that you have done so, then he'll bless you with general, uh, genuine understanding. What does it mean, pass the test? Well, it means that either the spiritual master directly himself personally, or by the arrangement of Lord Krishna personally, we're all going to be put in positions in life which put some, you could say, put some pressure on us in Krishna consciousness. Are we, are we really going to serve properly or are we going to get deviated? So like this, in one way or another, the disciple is tested while performing devotional service. And one must really do one's best to pass the test and not to fall a victim to Maya. And if one sincerely does one's best like that, the spiritual master gives mercy and Krishna gives, gives mercy. Uh, number seven, no blind following, no absurd inquiries. They are condemned. Number eight, uh, we must hear, but we must also get a clear understanding you don't just sit there in a sort of robotic way, uh, you know, with the instructions going past your head. You have to actually understand in submission service and inquiries. And then the last point, the bona fide guru is very merciful to the disciple. Therefore, when the disciple is submissive and is always ready to render service, the reciprocation of knowledge and inquiries becomes perfect. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, in, in a class in 1969, on this verse, on this specific verse, Prabhupada makes the following comments. Listen, it's, uh, it's a little extensive, but listen, it's very interesting. Blind following and observed, absurd inquiries are condemned in this verse. Blind following means, oh, there's a Swami and thousands of people are following him. I shall become his disciple. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is called blind following. I mean, let's face it, it happens in ISKCON too sometimes. You do not know whether he's a Swami or a rascal. But because everyone else is following, you want to become his disciple. This is blind following without knowledge. There are so many stories where a person approaches his spiritual master and asks him, can you show me God? And the spiritual master immediately shows him God. Quote, unquote. You see, this deception is going on. If you go to a professor and say, oh, if you're a professor, can you make me an MA, a Master of Arts, immediately? And he says, yes, why not? Then you're a fool, and he also is a fool. The so-called spiritual master is a rascal, and the man who has gone to him is also a rascal. Dhruva Maharaj went to the forest and had practiced many penances and austerities. Then he saw God. Can I see God immediately without being trained, without undergoing training? No, it's not possible. Sri Sri Radharadna, Sri Giri Govardhan, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Okay, so anyway, let's carry on.
I mean, there's more. There's more actually from the class, but if you want, you can uh, look it up. 1969, this verse. So we have a special question here from our devotees, for, for our devotees who are doing Bhakti Shastri on this verse, 434. And there's an extract from Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela, chapter 1, verse 44, purport. Adi Leela, 1, 44, purport. Prabhupada says, Every living entity is essentially a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the spiritual master is also his servant. Still, the spiritual master is a direct manifestation of the Lord. With this conviction, a disciple can advance in Krishna consciousness. The spiritual master is non-different from Krishna because he is a manifestation of Krishna. So the question is, uh, referring to a purport that was mentioned in class pertaining, or what is it now? Okay, yeah. A quote, quote a purport that was mentioned in the class pertaining to the spiritual master. This, this uh, purport we just read. The spiritual master is what? Krishna, because he is a what of Krishna. You look it up. So we carry on verse 35. And now this is the result. This is the result of receiving this knowledge. It's, it's really clear. Having obtained real knowledge from a self-realized soul, You'll never fall again into such illusion. For by this knowledge, you will see that all living beings are but part of the Supreme. Or in other words, that they are mine. Aha, uh -huh. they are mine, Krishna says. So, uh, you know, this is obviously, this is, uh, really, it's, Krishna consciousness. In the Sanskrit, Draksyas Yatman Yato Mai. In other words, Mai, Mai, they are mine. They belong to me. Aha. So, yeah, Prabhupada makes the point. Well, we just mentioned he makes the point right at the beginning of the purport. The result of receiving knowledge from a self-realized soul or one who knows things as they are is learning that all living beings are parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. Yes. And, and the sense of an existence separate from Krishna <laughs> is Maya. Yes. So, Prabhupada discusses this point of, well, of how people are prone to think they're separate from Krishna. Now we think we're separate from Krishna, but our philosophy is a chintya beda beda tattva. We're one with and different from Krishna. If we get too much into thinking about being one with Krishna, we become impersonalists. And if we get too much into thinking that we're different from Krishna, we become materialists with independent minds and independent ideas, and particularly independent from Krishna. So all the bodily differences, all the features of bodily existence, they're all maya. And Arjuna, in the second paragraph, Prabhupada discusses how Arjuna was in maya, because he was so much into the bodily relationships, and all of that was more important than his relationship with Krishna. 
So Prabhupada explains the whole teaching of Bhagavad Gita is for this purpose. Quote, that a living being as Krishna's eternal servitor cannot be separated from Krishna. And a sense of being an identity apart from Krishna is called Maya. So we must not be in Maya. And if we are, we must get out of Maya. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Prabhupada concludes concludes the purport. Uh, what now? Where are we? Where are we indeed? Well, it's not exactly the conclusion, but it's pretty close. Just a few sentences up from the end of the purport. Perfect knowledge is that the Supreme Soul Krishna is the supreme shelter for all living entities. And giving up such shelter, the living entities are deluded by the material energy, imagining themselves to have a separate identity. So now, yeah, so, so here, Krishna has described uh, how to understand the truth of life and of sacrifice. What will be the result of understanding all of that? It'll be full Krishna consciousness. And now he's going to explain how effective it is, how powerful. 36, even if you're considered to be the most sinful of all sinners, when you're situated in the boat of transcendental knowledge, you will be able to cross over the ocean of miseries. Um, we haven't exactly made a subsection of it officially, but verse 36 to verse 39 are describing the fruits, the results that will come to you if you get transcendental knowledge. So here, it's just, it's wonderful. Even if you're mo the most sinful of all sinners, if you get that transcendental knowledge, you'll cross over the ocean of misery. Any, any candidates for that position, the most sinful of all sinners? Whew. Yeah. So, so the thing is, just like... In chapter, in this chapter, but verse 9, Janma Karma Chamedev Yam Evam Yoveti Tatvataha, Krishna said, if you simply understand my, my appearance and activities, then you go back to Godhead. So, so basically, Krishna is, is repeating that. When you're situated in the boat, of transcendental knowledge, that transcendental knowledge, that being the essence, the foundation of transcendental knowledge, then that just that knowledge, just knowing that, and then of course acting on it, that's enough. Back home, back to Godhead. Otherwise, Prabhupada goes on to discuss this material world is like an ocean, and a very bad ocean, very heavy, big, heavy waves, and oh, all sorts of dangerous sharks and whatnot. And it doesn't matter how expert a swimmer you are. You could be the Olympic marathon swimming champion ten times over. But if you're dropped in the middle of the ocean, you're finished. That's all. Finished. End of story. Uh, so it's, it's like that, being dropped in the middle of the ocean. But it's also like being in the middle of a blazing forest fire. What can you do? You can't outrun it. You can't escape. So you become saved. How? By the spiritual master. 
who really helps you understand the truth and inspires you to act on the truth. So, uh, Sheila Prabhupada summarizes then, as usual. I mean, that oftentimes the last sentence or couple of sentences in, the, in, in many purports, they're just, you know, a nice little summary of the purport. So Prabhupada in this case says, perfect knowledge received from the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the path of liberation. The boat of Krishna consciousness is very simple, but at, same time, at the same time, the most sublime. Verse 37, again, glorifying what are the fruits of transcendental knowledge. As a blazing fire turns firewood, firewood to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge burn to ashes all reactions to material activities. The fire of that knowledge of who is Krishna is appearance and activities, first of all. Uh, yes, so it burns, it burns up, Prabhupada explains here. This, the fire of knowledge, transcendental knowledge is so powerful, not only does it burn up the reactions to past sins, bad things, but it also burns up the reactions to your pious activities. So you, you end up with a clean slate, no reactions. Yeah. Uh, so, let's just have a look. Prabhupada refers to, well, indirectly actually, he doesn't mention it, but concepts, well, anyway, okay. At the, towards the end of the purport, Prabhupada says, when one is in complete knowledge, all reactions, both a priori and a posteriori, are con consumed. Now, what is this? You know, even many English speakers, native English speakers, will not understand what's a priori. A priori means knowledge that is acquired uh, independent of any experience. No experience involved. Maybe you just heard and you got some knowledge. Where a posteriori knowledge is derived from experience. Verse 38, in this world, there's nothing so sublime and pure as transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism. And one who has become accomplished in the practice of devotional service enjoys this knowledge within himself in due course of time. Well, that's very nice. That's very nice. This uh, transcendental knowledge of Krishna is just the most amazing thing. And if you, uh, through, through this knowledge of Krishna consciousness, if you then take to devotional service, uh, then, well, Actually, it, Prabhupada, uh, Krishna said that this knowledge is the mature fruit of all mysticism. Yeah, so the mature fruit of devotion, it, it's the mature fruit of devotional service. And when you have it, you don't need to search for peace. Uh, and then you enjoy this knowledge within yourself. It does not mean that there's some sort of intellectual sense gratification going on, but it means that, that the presence of that knowledge in your life, in your heart and your life 
stimulates you to render service. And then when you render service, you become ecstatic. And of course, just to understand the knowledge is also ecstatic. So Prabhupada concludes, in other words, this knowledge and peace culminate in Krishna consciousness. That is the last word in the Bhagavad Gita. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Okay, verse 39. A faithful man who's dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subduces, subduces senses is eligible to achieve such knowledge. And having achieved it, he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. That's wonderful. So faith is mentioned again. Being faithful, having faith in the right things, in Krishna, in, in the process of Krishna consciousness, the books, uh, in the devotees, in the spiritual master. So a faithful person who, who's very serious about understanding and applying transcendental knowledge uh, to the point that he'll do anything. He'll subdue his senses just so he can be absorbed in transcendental knowledge. Then such a person attains the supreme spiritual peace, becomes ecstatic in Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada in the purport, does he really? No, but we can note that Lord Chaitanya has spoken a verse. What is faith? What is faith? Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kahe, Shujida Nishchoi, Krishna Bhakti Kaile Sarava Karma Krita Hoy. Faith means that simply by acting in Krishna consciousness, uh, well, okay. Anyway, the, in the in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that faith means that simply by performing devotional service in Krishna consciousness, one will fulfill all goals, all goals that could possibly be there. Plus, one will go back to God here. So, so therefore, Prabhupada says that a person who's faithful to Krishna and who controls the senses can easily attain perfection in the knowledge of Krishna consciousness without delay. And verse 40. So now those verses finishing with this last one we just read, 39. They are explaining the fruits, results of transcendental knowledge. Now, verse 40, verse 40, the subject changes, uh, at least verse 40 itself is a bit of a change of theme, contrasting, a warning. But ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain Krishna consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul there's happiness neither in this world nor in the next. <clears throat> and Srila Prabhupada in his, you know, oftentimes pretty dramatic, very clearly expressing things, his, his manner of, of doing like that. Um, Prabhupada makes the point that uh, people who don't do this, these people being mentioned here who are ignorant and faithless and doubt the scriptures, Prabhupada says, just right at the beginning of the purport, <clears throat> these are persons who are almost like animals. They're almost like animals. Even some of them have some knowledge of these things, but uh, Shastra, scripture, 
but they have no faith. So they don't render devotional service. They fall down. Uh, yes. They fall down. They find happiness neither in this world nor in the next. So in a class, in a lecture on this verse, Srila Prabhupada said, how do we become faithful? Samyata Indriya. We have to control the senses. We're here in material existence because we want to gratify the senses. That is our problem. So this faith of spiritual advancement can be enhanced when we agree at the same time, Samyata Indriya. If a physician is treating you, you have faith in him. But if the physician says, don't do this, and you do it, then what kind of faith have you got? When a physician treats a patient, he prescribes something. Don't do this and do this. Some do not, some do's. Now, if I say, my dear physician, I have all faith in you, but I cannot follow, follow your instruction. You say, do not, but I do it. So how can you? How are you faithful? So, Shraddhavan Labate Gyanam Tatpara Samyatendriya. You have to follow the instruction with faith. Okay, verse 41. Uh, one who acts in devotional service, renouncing the fruits of his actions, and whose doubts have been destroyed by transcendental knowledge, is situated factually in the self. Thus he is not bound by the reactions of work, O conqueror of riches. Wow, that's just so nice. So wonderful. Mm. And let, let me just read the purport. It's a really nice purport. One who follows the instruction of the Bhagavad Gita as it's imparted by the Lord, the personality of Godhead himself, becomes free from all doubts by the grace of transcendental knowledge. He, as a part and parcel of the Lord, in full Krishna consciousness, is already established in self-knowledge. As such, he is undoubtedly above bondage to action. And verse 42, the very last verse in this chapter. Therefore, the doubts which have arisen in your heart out of ignorance should be slashed by the weapon of knowledge. Armed with yoga, O Bharata, stand and fight. So, this... Uh, this purport is sort of, you could say, it's something like a summary of the chapter. It's like a summary of the chapter. Let's just draw out a few points from it. So Srila Prabhupada says uh, that the yoga system instructed here is called Sanatan Yoga or Eternal Yoga eternal activities performed by the living entity. Um, but now this yoga has two divisions of sacrifices. Two different types of sacrifices make up this yoga. One is sacrifice of your material possessions, and the other is sacrifice in knowledge of the self. And the first type, just sacrificing your possessions, uh, if it's not dovetailed for spiritual not realization, becomes material. But if it's done for spiritual realization or in devotional service, it becomes the perfect sacrifice. So in terms of spiritual realization, there are two divisions understanding the self and understanding 
the Supreme Lord, uh, then you know there's a type of a sequence. If we understand who we are as part and parcel of Krishna, then we can understand him. <clears throat> Just like we've seen already in Bhagavad Gita, how in the beginning, Krishna didn't tell anything about himself. He just explained how we're not these bodies. And, and like now, particularly in this fourth chapter, he's really been clearly explaining about himself. But before that, in the other chapters, not so much, not, not like in the fourth chapter at all. So there's a type of a sequence. And, and in our preaching, Prabhupada in his preaching, he preached like this. First of all, you're not your body, you're eternal spirit soul. Then, as spirit soul, you're the eternal servant of Krishna. And if one doesn't understand <laughs> Prabhupada, <clears throat> to the point, as always, Prabhupada says, in spite of, this is kind of the middle of the purport or something like that. Uh, what have I done now? In spite of such instructions, one who does not uh, understand the real nature of the Lord is the eternal, blissful, all-knowing personality of Godhead is certainly full number one. Whew. We've got a lot of candidates in this world. A lot of candidates. And then, of course, the last kind of half of the chapter or last third of the chapter Sacrifice, very important to do sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice in knowledge, render, render service to the Lord, understanding, appreciating the Lord. And one who seeks that objective is the real student of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and, and one should learn all these things under the instructions of a spiritual master, let us just... Uh, so Prabhupada says, the Lord is definitely the Supreme Person. This is the end of the purport. And his activities are transcendental. One who understands this is a liberated person from the very beginning of his study of Bhagavad Gita, Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ke Jai. Hare Paul. Sri Sri Radha Radnath Sri Giri Govardhan Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ke Jai. Mm -hmm.